Well, it's great to be with you on this Serve Sunday. Who's glad to be in church today? Come on, anybody? Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. And as always, I want to look right into the camera and say hello to all of our locations, all of our churches, all around the great state of New York and the great state of Pennsylvania, and to the men and women at our extension sites and nursing homes. We want to thank you for joining us today. And to those of you watching us online or on demand, we're so glad that you're here. How about everybody? Can we put our hands together and make everybody who's joining us today feel welcome, show them some crazy love? Well, I am so pleased to be with you today. And I want to talk to you about serving like a boss. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, serve like a boss. Well, when I was... In elementary school, I used to fantasize about what it would be like to be in charge. Because when you're little and you don't have any power, you you just dream about what it would be like to have power and to be in charge. So I would say things like when I'm in charge or when I'm a parent, I'm going to eat candy all day. I'm going to go play video games whenever I want. I'm going to be rich and I'm never going to tell my kids no. I'm going to buy them all the things that I want. Well, as I got older, my dreams got a little more sophisticated, but some of the root ideas stayed the same. I want to be in charge of my life and I don't want anybody to have to tell me what to do. I want to kick it back on easy street and uh, I, I didn't want anyone to have to be in charge over myself. I was pretty focused on myself. I didn't want to have to serve my parents. I didn't want to have to serve anybody else. And I think we all have a similar sort of orientation where we want to rise higher. We want to accomplish our dreams. We want to overcome obstacles. In our own way, we all want to be the boss But as long as we're only focused on ourselves, we'll miss what God has for us. The disciples are a little bit similar to this in Mark chapter 10. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to rule. And I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10 to hear about the disciples' desire to be the boss. Mark 10, 35 says it like this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Jesus, that is. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Like, grant us this little petition. Grant us this wish. And and essentially they said, hey, I want to sit on your right and on your left. Jesus, when you come into your glory, we want to rule with you. They wanted to be the boss. And so Jesus' question to them is really simple. He says, hey, can you suffer with me? Well, the other disciples, they find out about this, that somebody, how dare them, try to get ahead. And they they were not excited about that at all. In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus called them all together and he sits everybody down and he's saying, okay, now you guys want to be the boss. Let me give you some instructions for what it looks like to be the boss. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who were regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercised authority over them. They had the same dreams as me as kids. Like, hey, when I'm older, when I have some power, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to do things my way. Verse 43, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the title of today's message is to serve like a boss. There's Jesus in God's kingdom, in God's economy, is saying, hey, if you want to be great, you got to become the least. If you want to get big, you've got to get small. If you want to be like Jesus, you've got to serve. So I think of it this way. God brings people and opportunities across our path so that we can be a blessing. And when we serve others, we serve like the boss. 
So when you bring that elderly neighbor food each week, when you clean up at the office, even though it, you didn't make the mess, when you mentor that young man that doesn't have a father, that's what allows God to take you higher. When you serve others, favor is released in your life. And we think it's the other way around. We think we have to work our way to the top. But the truth is, you've got to serve your way to the top. The scripture says that when Job prayed for his friends, he got well. In other words, when he served others, he was blessed. Something powerful happens when you get your mind off yourself and you go out and you go do good for somebody else. So my question to you is this, are you serving anyone besides you? Are you doing something for others outside of what your job requires? Serve your way up. When you focus not just on accomplishing your dreams, but on serving others, then you're gonna have more joy and you're gonna be more fulfilled. The reason some people aren't happy is all they think about is themselves. My dreams, my goals, my problems, my family. And I say this respectfully, but you need to take a break from you. It's not healthy to have you on your mind all the time. You got to take a break from what's bothering you and take a break from what you want and what you're believing for and go and be good to somebody else. When you serve others, that's a seed that you're sowing. God's going to make sure people are good to you. But if you're not getting good breaks and, and you need to ask yourself, am I giving any good breaks? Am I showing people favor? Am I just doing what's required? Or am I going to go the extra mile and serve others? So I want to give you today three reasons why serving is essential in God's kingdom, if we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to begin to serve like a boss, there's a, these are three reasons why serving is essential in God's kingdom. So number one, fill this in in your notes, serving others releases blessing from God. Isaiah tells us what, how this works in Isaiah chapter 58. It says it like this, is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and, when, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? I love this. Then somebody turn to your neighbor and say, then then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly, quickly appear. Then, somebody say then. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. What happens is too often we're waiting for the light to break forth and we're waiting for the healing and we want the promotion. And, and, and the question is, have we done the first part? Have we served somebody? Have we been a blessing? When that coworker has to put their car in the shop, you say, hey, let me swing by and pick you up. I can bring you to work this week. You just serve somebody. When that single mom is struggling to pay her rent, hey, let me get you your groceries this month. You just fed the hungry. When that coworker doesn't know how to work that computer program and everybody sits around in Snickers because they're too old to run the computer, you can say, hey, let me stay late and teach you what I know. I'm going to help you to learn. When you make it your business to serve, you release God to go before you and to promote you. So number two, God sees what's done in secret and he rewards it in the open. So this is what Matthew chapter six, verse one says it like this. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to what? Everybody together to be seen by them. Otherwise, you're gonna have no reward from your father in heaven. God is, Jesus is saying here that if you want to be seen, you're gonna get your reward. 
But if you do it in secret without being seen, then it, you're going to get your reward from heaven. Now, Matthew chapter 5 says to do good deeds that everybody would see them in what? Glorify your Father in heaven. So we got to take ourself out of the equation that Jesus actually wants us to serve. But when we do it, not to gratify myself, not to promote me, but to promote God, that's when he rewards in the open in front of everybody else. If you're trying to trick God into blessing you and you want blessing for men, it's going to become apparent. But what has to happen is, verse Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. They may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, in verse 3, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will him himself reward you openly. So don't worry if you're not getting credit. Don't get discouraged if people don't thank you. God sees your sacrifice. He sees you buying those supplies for your students. He, he sees you taking care of that friend that's not well. He sees you getting up early to go sing on the worship team. God knows how to thank you. He knows how to open the windows of heaven. And you can't be good to somebody without God being good back to you. That's not the reason why we do it. It's just the way God is. When you give, he gives more back. And when you show favor, he shows you more favor. And I think about all the volunteers that make Two Rivers work each week, all the ushers, the host team, the prayer team, people that visit the nursing homes on the extent, in our extension sites, that go to serve at our extension sites, that, that are helping those in addictions and recovery in the Hope Homes, the hundreds of people that come early and stay late on their day off, they've already worked 40 hours, they could be at home resting, they could be running errands, enjoying their hobbies instead. What are you doing? You're serving, you're helping others, you're giving. And some of you volunteers, I've never said thank you in person, one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, I'm grateful. But the truth is this, you don't have to have my thanks. I don't control the universe. When the Most High God thanks you, things are going to happen that you couldn't make happen on your own. His blessing will take you where you've never dreamed. So number three is this, serving is a test that brings promotion. God promotes good character. Oftentimes, what we pray for is we say, God, I'm praying that you're going to promote me. Just like the disciples. I want to be the boss. I want to go to the higher level. I want to be able to be in charge. But God is looking for those whose character is promotable. And serving is the test of our character. Sometimes we don't want to serve because it seems small and insignificant. But on the way to the big things that God has in store, he's going to test us with the small things. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says it like this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. What does God want to see out of your life before he gives you the much? He wants to see you take care of the little. And whoever is dishonest with the very little will also be dishonest with much. God is testing us with serving. He's testing, will you take care of the least of these? So don't discount working in the nursery. Don't talk yourself out of going the extra mile, serving your family, getting up early, taking care of the children, making sure everything's all right every day. Thank you, Crystal, for serving and doing all of those things. Every day. I see it. I'm stealing your reward from God right now. But nobody, nobody might be saying thank you. Like your kids might not be saying thank you. It feels unnoticed, but God sees what you're doing, moms. That's what leads to promotion. Maybe you're working at a job that you feel is beneath you and you know that you have more in you. It's tempting to think, 
When I get promoted, when that new door opens, then I'll be my best. Then I'll give it my all. But first, according to God's kingdom, you got to serve where you are with a good attitude. And if you'll excel in the small position, do more than you have to. Don't do just enough. Don't do enough to get by. Don't quiet quit. When you do more than you have to, then God will open something bigger. I remember when I was running from God, I felt so ashamed. I felt like I couldn't serve in the house of the Lord anymore. I felt like I had messed my life up so much that there's no way that I could step into my calling because I had sinned and I felt shame. And I told God, as hard as I ran from you, I'm going to run toward you. And I said, God, if you'll let me be back in the house of the Lord, I'll do anything. I'll scrub toilets. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I called my pastor and, and I went into a meet him in an office and, and he sent me home. A couple days later, he calls me back and he says, hey, there's a part-time children's pastor position open at one of our other locations. And I remember getting that call from Pastor Ted and thinking, I just got my master's degree in organizational leadership and I'll do anything, but I don't want to work with kids. I'll do anything, God, I'll do anything, but I don't want to work with kids. My calling is greater than that. My anointing is greater than that. I felt so ashamed. I don't even feel like I could work in the house of the Lord. God, I'll do anything. Wait, and now I get an opportunity to serve. And I was like, no, no, I can't do that. I talked to my wife and she said, well, you need to think about it and pray about it because at least it pays you something. She's a little salty because I quit my job to follow God. And, and in that, she's just maybe not even salty, maybe just even more practical than I, I was being. And, and maybe you're like me and you want to be in ministry and you want to do something significant, but the church isn't looking for a lead pastor. They need volunteers in children's church. And we think, I don't want to take care of kids. I, I do that all week with my children. I want to be on the platform. And it might seem small, but it's a key to your promotion. It may, it may not be the main thing in your heart, but it's leading you to the main thing. Because I said yes to God. I, I went back, I listened to my wife. I, I called Pastor Ted back. I said, yes, I will do that. I will serve in the children's ministry. We left the location we were at. We went to another location. And, and the basement was where they were doing children's church. It was filthy. We had to clean it up. It stunk. We'd, I'd have to come in every week. I'd have to... I'd have to clean everything. I'd have to t take it all together. I was making almost no money at all as the lead children's pastor. And, and I went and I would show up. We eventually outgrew the basement we, out of necessity because it was so bad it would flood and it was just a terrible environment. There would be rat turd and, and just a, a miserable space for children. So we went over, we got into the gymnasium, but the gym leaked and it would leak tar onto the floor and I'd have to come and I'd have to mop up the tar every week and we'd put out a bounce house and we'd set up all the chairs and we'd set up this whole stage. And every week we'd have to convert this gymnasium into a place to serve children. And it was through doing that that God opened the door for me to step into the lead children's pastor position at Life360 Church. It was where God used all of that in my life to, to train me, to hone me, and to set me up for the moment that he was going to call me to come to Binghamton to start another church. And you can't skip that step to reach your goal. You can't, it, success is not an elevator. It's, it's a set of stairs that God leads us up step by step. So, so my question to you is, will you serve even though it seems insignificant? This is what David did. He's anointed to be the next king of Israel when he's 17 years old. And the prophet Samuel came to his house unannounced and he chose him from a lineup of all of his brothers. And he's destined to do great things. God's called him. He's anointed to be the king. He's got this anointing on his life. And then he goes back to the shepherd's fields to take care of sheep like he had done for years. Now, one day his father asked him, son, I want you to take some sandwiches and some cheese to your brothers. They're off in another city in the army. 
And, and, and if David could have thought in that moment, dad, I'm not an errand boy. I'm, a, I'm not a gopher. I'm a king. You saw Samuel anoint me. I'm not going to serve my brothers. I, I shouldn't be bringing them food. Do you know who I am? I'm a big deal. He could have been too proud to do this small thing. And instead, the next morning, he set out with those lunches. And when he arrived at the camp, he heard Goliath, the champion of the Philistine army, taunting the Israelites. And if David hadn't been willing to serve in this small area, taking his brother's lunches, he never would have met Goliath. Because then David, he faces Goliath. His purpose was hidden in what seemed to be insignificant. I want to say that again. I want you to look right at me, and I want you to hear this. Your purpose might be hidden in what seems insignificant. You have to be willing to do something small before God is going to trust you with something great. David was led to his destiny by delivering a sandwich. You would think that when God anointed him king, you would say, David, the next step is to go meet with the commander of the army. You're going to go in the palace. You're going to start strategizing. You're going to learn all of these things. Instead, God said, the next step, I want you to go take care of the sheep and then take your brothers to lunch. And I wonder if a new level is waiting for you in what seems insignificant. Don't put off opportunities to do good to those around you, to serve people. Like David, you might have bigger things in your heart. What's in front of you doesn't line up with your vision. But David, he could have thought, I'm a king, not a delivery man. You don't know where that small step is leading. I love it because Saul heard that this young man, David, is interested in fighting Goliath. And the scripture says, Saul sent for David. He had somebody bring him in. And here David simply went to bring a lunch, and now he's standing in the presence of the king. It's amazing what can happen when you serve. Just being faithful, doing something that seems small, and you don't know when you're going to get called in. You don't know how God is going to use that little thing to promote you. Because promotion doesn't come from people, it comes from the Lord. It comes when It's your time. God is going to cause you to be seen. He'll cause you to be at the right place. He'll cause you to be called in. There are moments in your future where like David, because you're serving, you're giving, you're helping others. God is going to suddenly, he's going to push you into that new level. God knows how to change your status. He knows how to pump and bump you up into another dimension. It's in one touch of God's favor. And and what releases that favor in your life is your willingness to serve. If you go back to point number one, God blesses those who serve. It not only affects you, but it impacts your whole family. You might not see how it can happen. Neither did David. He's just delivering lunch. He's serving what seemed like a small area. You don't know what God's up to when you serve. I love this. We're going we're gonna to start to wrap it up right here. But what's interesting is David didn't deliver lunches looking for the opportunity. He didn't go thinking, well, maybe I'll get a good break. Maybe I'll make it an important connection. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll meet the king. He didn't have his own agenda. He wasn't trying to manipulate things. He was just faithfully serving, doing what his father asked, and the opportunity came to him. And this is where I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to serve somebody else. I want to challenge you to serve on a team, to make a difference with your life. At the end of this experience today, I want all week long for us to go out of here to make a specific, tangible plan how we're going to serve somebody. And I want to bring up the QR code on the screen so you can go. You should find this in your email inbox, but servolution.org has so many ideas of how we can serve. And this is my dream as a church, that we would release God's favor into our lives 
by simply serving the people around us, that we would go make a difference. I love this, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. It says it like this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, when you and I serve, we serve like the boss. When we go ahead and decrease, when we do the little things, when we take care of people, even though it costs us, even though it's inconvenient, even though it doesn't feel all the time like somebody is giving us thanks, God sees it, he rewards it in open, and it is the test that brings us promotion. I wanna pray for you. Jesus, I pray now that you would turn our thoughts of being in charge on the head. Like we're not gonna be like this world. We're gonna be like you taught us. That the greatest among us will become the least. That we will become the servant of all. That there's some things that in serving, we don't understand how it's gonna bring any favor to us. But we just know it's what you did. It's how you called us to lead. And we wanna serve like you, Jesus. We wanna become more like you. So I pray that our schedules wouldn't get in the way. I pray that, that we wouldn't let anything keep us from doing what you've called us to do in Jesus' name, amen.